Los Angeles, 1942. A city thrown into a state of panic following the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. There was a widespread understanding that the West Coast could be next. The front lines could be right there at their shores. As tension mounts, bigotry and hatred rise to the surface, and young Mexican-Americans become public enemy number one. The war wasn't just being fought overseas. Being different was not permissible. This became fuel for the fire. This is the shocking story of wartime hysteria reaching boiling point, and how a city spins out of control into violent chaos. People wanted an enemy. If you can't fight the Japanese overseas, you can't fight the Germans overseas, why not fight here at home? Los Angeles, the late 1930s. A hotbed of celebrity, sunshine and style. A metropolis in bloom one of the most racially diverse cities in America. Despite its ethnic mix and the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, it is also surprisingly conservative. For the young generation, however, an explosive musical form invading from the East Coast is shaking up the old order, jazz. This is a period of American segregation, where segregation is written into the laws, it's certainly written into the social customs as well. And at the heart of segregation is that if you're racialized as a minority, you're supposed to stay in your own quarter. This is what's expected in the public spheres of Los Angeles. But what's happening on the street, and certainly in the dance clubs, is something significantly different. During the 30s, it is when jazz artists like Cab Calloway, Dizzy Gillespie, and so many others begin touring the country. These musicians and artists are traveling from Harlem to Los Angeles, drawing crowds of not just African-American youth, not just Anglo-American youth, but also Mexican-American youth. Color didn't matter. For people who were in the jazz, color didn't matter. What mattered was your ability to express yourself and what was genuinely inside you, whether it was through dance, whether it was through music, even fashion as well. And in the jazz world, there is no fashion more striking than the zoot suit. Popularized by the musicians themselves, for those drawn into this new subculture, it becomes an emblem of urban cool. The zoot suit with its baggy, ballooned out pant style at the thighs, tapering very closely to the ankle at the knees, oftentimes with the long tail coat flowing, the gold or silver watch chain that young men often twirled. It was all part and parcel of a different and unique kind of expression of American youth identity. For the young people who wore this, this clothing, for them, it was liberating in a way that they felt a sense of pride. Now, this flies in the face of segregation now. You're a racialized young person strutting down the street in your finery, and what you're saying to the American public is, notice me on my terms. As Los Angeles enters the 1940s, the zoot suit becomes a common sight across the city. In Mexican neighborhoods, a new self-assured and independent generation is being liberated by the jazz subculture and develops its own distinctive look and attitude. And as US citizens, these youths are keen to play their part in the American dream. Whereas Mexican parents were often quite conservative and had conservative religious values with the Catholic faith, the second generation were American-born and they considered themselves as such. This was a time when many Mexican immigrant parents expected their children to remain home until they got married and Mexican-American youth wanted to be American teenagers. These were individuals that were looking to engage in American consumer culture, to go downtown to public venues, to intermingle with whites, to intermingle with blacks. Yet they face obstacles. The Mexican community has long been viewed as a threat to the white Los Angelinos at the top of the social ladder. Although California itself had been a Mexican territory in the previous century, by the early 1900s it became a predominantly white domain. The decade-long Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 1920 saw huge volumes of refugees seeking solace in the US, where they are immediately regarded with suspicion. What we see is a million plus Mexican 
immigrants move northward across the border on the trail north and settle in the United States, many of them in Los Angeles. These folks land in LA in the 19 teens, in the early 1920s, and like any other immigrant community, they put down roots and they were constantly bombarded with the question, what role, what position do they have in American, in Los Angeles, in Southern California society? By the 1930s, California's so-called Mexican problem dominates public debate. Prominent voices in local government, academic institutions, and in the press express grave concerns over these newcomers. They believe that Mexicans are inferior, that they will bring down the quote-unquote racial stock of the uh, American nation more generally. Mexicans are not only inferior, but they're dirty, they're lazy. They will ultimately put into peril in some form or fashion the greatness of the American Southwest. The children of these immigrants, the first generation of Mexican-Americans, yearn to be modern Los Angeles teenagers. And although they find a home in the jazz subculture, like their parents, their lives are severely limited by the city's racial restrictions. Los Angeles is a quite segregated city. You had a number of public places that often would just turn Mexicans away, movie theaters that would say Mexicans could not sit in the seats on the lower level, that they would have to sit in the balcony. Swimming pools were a similar story. Oftentimes, Mexicans and blacks were not allowed to use public swimming pools unless it was a day before the pool was going to be cleaned. If you were out in public spaces, um, and there is a uh, white person walking in your direction and you're walking down the sidewalk. The expectation was that you would defer to white privileges. You would just simply step off the sidewalk and into the street or to the gutter and let that person pass, and then you step back on. Segregation had an impact on all aspects of life. As these young Mexican-Americans look to forge their own identity in such an oppressive environment, at the close of 1941, their city would turn even more hostile. On December the 7th, the Japanese military launch a surprise attack on the US Pacific Fleet stationed at Pearl Harbor. And in this 90-minute raid, more than 2,000 Americans lose their lives. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. By the time President Roosevelt announces that the United States is entering World War II, the shocked citizens of Los Angeles are living in a state of fear. There was a great sense of insecurity, fragility on the West Coast after the Pearl Harbor attack. Imagine this Japanese fleet had stole undetected all the way from Japan, across the Northern Pacific, and then descended on Oahu and bombed the US Navy and bombed its airfields undetected. The battleship fleet that was attacked at Pearl Harbor had been based here in Los Angeles. The battleship fleet was headquartered at Long Beach, California, as well as San Pedro, and it was moved in May of 1940 to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So many of the people that died on the ships had families here in Los Angeles. It put the city on edge. If it could happen in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, why couldn't it happen in Los Angeles? Believing that Hawaiian spies were gathering intelligence for the Japanese military in the months prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, the US government fears that there are similar enemies on the mainland. The 19th of February, 1942, having already ordered the removal of all Japanese immigrants from California the previous month, President Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066, which displaces Japanese Americans from their homes and forces them into internment camps across the West Coast. The decision to remove non-U.S. citizen Japanese from California, and then the decision to intern Japanese Americans. This was an absolutely enormous decision, fraught with all kinds of political and constitutional questions. And this is 120,000 members of that community who are removed because there are fears that this is an enemy alien population. They had to sell. Whatever they had, whatever their property was, they had to sell it. Or if they couldn't sell, they simply lost their property. It was more than just an inconvenience. 
for the duration of the war, whatever industry they had, whatever businesses they had, whatever real estate they had, gone. And although the decision is extreme, just days after the executive order is signed, a Japanese submarine launches an attack on the Californian coastline. In Los Angeles, the fear of a full-blown invasion intensifies. It was the first attack on American soil by a foreign country since the War of 1812. This was just thought impossible. It scared the living daylights out of people. They're here, and as Japanese and Japanese Americans were being removed, eyes then turned to the other enemy within, and that was seen as Mexican youth. The concern over the newly emboldened, zoot suit-clad Mexican Americans transforms overnight into fully-fledged moral panic. As hysterical reports circulate of violent gangs, robberies and knife attacks, Los Angeles goes to war with these teenagers. This is an enemy that must be fought on our own shores. It is up to the American people to remain vigilant. It is up to the Los Angeles Police Department to get a handle on this alleged Mexican crime wave. Los Angeles, 1942. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor and America's entry into the Second World War, the city's inhabitants feel exposed to attack. As potential enemies are incarcerated in internment camps along the West Coast, in this febrile atmosphere, a new threat is detected. The young Mexican-Americans in the east of the city. With their jazz slang, their zoot suits and their short skirts, these supposed delinquents are identified as a criminal menace. There is a need, particularly after the internment of Japanese-Americans, to find ways to make people feel safe. And that next to Japanese Americans in Los Angeles and throughout much of California, in fact, zoot suiters are considered to be public enemy number two. In many ways, this concern with Mexican American juvenile delinquency appeared out of nowhere almost, it, or at least it appeared to appear out of nowhere. And it was very much, I think, a symptom of wartime hysteria, of the xenophobia that often accompanies wartime. And it was also produced very much by the people who wanted to sell newspapers. The newspapers share a lot of the blame, but people wanted an enemy. Each writer was trying to top the other with flamboyant language, made up stories, and it did not reflect what was truly going on. A lot of it was based on pure fabrication, but the sad part is it created racism against Latinos. This comes at a time when American values are being redefined. The nation is looking for good citizens, hard workers, and committed supporters of the war effort. And conservative and Christian values are celebrated. There was a tremendous emphasis on conformity in the United States during this period. And it, it makes sense, of course, that there was, uh, the United States government was tremendously invested in getting all the citizens in support of the war effort. And then you've got this self-expression that's happening on the streets, which people are reading as they are not like us and they are not joining us in our effort to express our Americanism. If they're not serving in the military, in the armed forces, if they're not working steadfastly in the war industry, what is it that they're doing? They can't be helping win the war. People were expected to make sacrifices for the war effort, including using fewer textiles, you know, less fabric in their clothing. The fabric had to be used for soldiers' uniforms, for parachutes, for blankets. And the zoot look was very flamboyant. It was extravagant, and it appeared to fly in the face of the demands to sacrifice for the war effort. Although the Los Angeles news media demonizes these youths, outside of a few minor felonies, they lack any significant incidents to substantiate claims of a major crime wave. This changes in the summer of 1942 with the case of Jose Diaz, a 22-year-old Mexican immigrant who is about to enlist in the US Army. Jose Diaz, he was the oldest child of his family, and by all accounts, he was the ideal older brother. Because he was born in Mexico, he was not yet a citizen of the United States, but nonetheless, he volunteered to serve in the U.S. Army because this was the only country he knew. 
and he felt a loyalty to this country, and so that's the kind of young man he was. When his family moved to Los Angeles, like a lot of other Mexican immigrant families, they moved around for a time. By the time Jose was a young man, he and his family were living um, at Williams Ranch. It was a large ranch, and they had several families of farm workers living there. So you had a Chinese family living there, you had an Italian immigrant family living there. You had half a dozen or so other Mexican uh, families living there. So in, in some ways, it was, it was almost like a small rural village. And on Saturday, August the 1st, 1942, a birthday celebration is held in the heart of this rustic community. Due to report to the Army Recruitment Office after the weekend, for Diaz, it represents one last chance to party before his military service begins. This is a family celebration. All the neighbors are invited, all families invited to come out to this ranch. The, the food is set out, they'll be dancing as well. As the celebration spills into the early hours of the morning, the atmosphere is suddenly changed by the arrival of some unexpected guests looking for trouble. A fight breaks out, a small ride, if you will, where suddenly uh, a number of these young people attack the party goers. In the aftermath of this fight, party goers are trying to pick themselves up, they're trying to see who's hurt, who's on the ground. They find the body of Jose Diaz, perhaps about 60 yards away, in a darkened spot, mortally wounded. He's unconscious. He'd been stabbed a couple of times, brutally beaten. Someone runs off uh, to find a phone to call an ambulance. The ambulance comes out, uh, and, and he's taken to Los Angeles General Hospital. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. He never regains consciousness, and he dies. At any other time, the death of Jose Diaz may have attracted little attention. Yet in the summer of 1942, it becomes a symbol of the endemic Mexican crime wave being reported in the press. And for city officials and the LAPD, it also proves opportune, as their reputation with the wider public is at an all-time low. Los Angeles, despite the beaches, the palm trees, the great weather, the glamour of Hollywood, underneath it was very dirty. There was corruption at the highest levels, from the mayor all the way through the police department. There was a lot of vice in Los Angeles. Where there's vice, there's money, and people can be bought. Once Diaz's body is found, the police department realizes that this is an opportunity to uplift their image and to demonstrate that they have Mexican criminality and crime under control. Their response is to instantly go on the offensive. Police officers rampage through the neighborhoods of East Los Angeles, arresting any young Mexican-Americans on site. Following the murder of Diaz, the LAPD does in fact round up 600 plus Mexican-American youth from across the city. 600 for the murder of one individual. When the police go on these dragnet raids, they begin to hone in on a number of youths from the 38th Street neighborhood and they begin to call these individuals a gang. They refer to them as the 38th Street Gang. The press refers to them as the 38th Street Gang. They became evidence. They were upheld as evidence of uncontrolled Mexican-American youth in the city, a, a, a Mexican-American youth gang wave. The arrest of the 38th Street youths becomes a major media event within California and it sets the wheels in motion for what will be the largest murder trial in the state's history. But rather than calm wartime hysteria, this notorious case is about to add fuel to a fire that will rage out of control. Los Angeles, World War II. In a city in the throes of wartime hysteria, the battle against the Axis powers is sharing the front pages with reports about another enemy the local Mexican-American youths. It's the summer of 1942, and the murder of Jose Diaz is being used by the authorities to confirm fears of a Mexican crime wave. After dragging hundreds of suspects into custody, the LAPD soon turn their attention to a group of teenagers from East LA's 38th Street area. Witnesses recognize these youths as the gang who crashed the party near Sleepy Lagoon, where Diaz lost his life and soon a ringleader is identified, Henry Hank Levas. Henry had a natural charisma about him. He was a natural leader. 
Because of his natural leadership abilities and because he was a little bit older, he was singled out. The prosecution needs to find a leader in order to sell the case to the jury that this is a game. Here's the leader. He's the one that created this mess, that, that, that rallied all of the gang together to then go out and, and create some destruction. Looking for an open and shut case, the police are incensed when Henry Levas protests his innocence and resort to more brutal methods to extract a confession. He was beaten to a pulp. According to his sister, Lupe, she, she reported that she could barely recognize her brother. The Los Angeles Police Department was notorious for being especially vicious toward Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. This is a period where it was normal in American policing to beat a confession out of you. The suspicion was, particularly when it dealt with people of color, suspicion was they'll never tell you the truth. Despite the beatings, Levas refuses to confess. In October 1942, he and 17 other youths from 38th Street stand accused of the killing of Jose Diaz. The case is the largest murder trial in Californian history and becomes a major media event which proves useful for the Los Angeles authorities. At that very same time, another LAPD police officer is on trial for beating a prisoner to death. And the fact that you had the Sleepy Lagoon murder trial happening at the same time, that took the police officer beating case off of the front page and it was replaced by the Sleepy Lagoon case. What's interesting about the Sleepy Lagoon trial is that typically one Mexican kid killing another would not be seen as news. But in this case, the police and the press run with it, and they see it as a way of demonstrating that we are taking care of the Mexican problem in our city. Although the authorities intend to use the case for their own agenda, during the trial, Levas presents his own account of what happened on August the 1st, 1942. His story opens at Sleepy Lagoon itself, where he and his girlfriend began the night. Henry had gone to Sleepy Lagoon with his girlfriend, Dora Barrios, and it was a popular spot for lovers at night. Mexican-American youth hung out at Sleepy Lagoon in part because they weren't always allowed to swim in the municipal pools within city limits. So Sleepy Lagoon being on the outskirts of Los Angeles beyond city limits uh, was a draw. It is almost midnight as Henry and Dora leave the lagoon and head back to their car. Sudden headlights on the road blind them, and without warning, they are viciously attacked. Members of the, the so-called Downey Gang arrived and attacked Henry and his girlfriend. That's when Henry went back to the 38th Street neighborhood, reported to his friends what had happened to him and Dora, and they went back to Sleepy Lagoon to retaliate. They were basically on the hunt. The 38th Street crew takes it upon themselves to confront the group that they felt had disrespected them earlier. It is a case of mistaken identity. The Downey boys were not at the party. And although Levas and his friends admit starting the fight, they also claim that Jose Diaz wasn't there when they arrived. And other partygoers confirm this story. The brutal murder is witnessed by no one, and Diaz's body is discovered not by his neighbors, but by girls from the 38th Street group. Betty Nunez Zeiss and Dora Barrios discovered Diaz's nearly lifeless body on the ground. His pockets had been turned out. He'd been paid recently. He had probably been robbed. With no murder weapon, nor any witnesses to the attack, the prosecution's case seems flimsy. Yet this is a show trial, and its outcome is all but inevitable. The whole of the Los Angeles legal system is quite biased towards members of the Mexican community at this time. The judge of the trial does not allow the defendants to sit with legal counsel. You have testimony introduced into court by an individual from the Sheriff's Department, Captain Aris, talking about the fact that Mexicans are by nature criminals. They are by nature violent because of their Aztec roots and ancestry. And this is 
seen as perfectly appropriate. January the 12th, 1943, the jury reaches their verdict. Henry Levas and two friends are found guilty of first degree murder and are sentenced to life imprisonment, while nine others are interred in San Quentin for second degree murder. Levas's mother weeps as she watches her son's conviction and one of the biggest trials in state history draws to a close. For the city of LA, the hope that these convictions would relieve local tensions never materializes. In fact, since America entered the war a year earlier, a huge influx of newcomers have been making the already fractious environment even more hostile. Thousands of soldiers and sailors arrived in Los Angeles at the same time that workers Prospective workers were arriving in Los Angeles. Los Angeles was very much a boom town. With its good weather, cheap oil, and vast areas of undeveloped land, LA becomes a perfect hub for war production, while its naval ports serve as a crucial embarkation point for the war in the Pacific. Bringing millions of temporary inhabitants into the city, this influx radically alters life for local residents. And for a Mexican-American community already feeling persecuted, a new naval training facility erected downtown intensifies racial divisions. There is an area of town still known as the Chavez Ravine, and the Chavez Ravine was, a, was long a segregated area, first settled by Jewish immigrants to Los Angeles and then populated by Mexican immigrants as well. On this site, uh, the city of Los Angeles built then a uh, Naval Reserve Armory. So it's a building and it was used as a training facility for radio men in particular. And this growing number of naval draftees, reservists coming in for training and are now coming into contact with Los Angeles's Latino population, which is the biggest in the United States. This Naval Reserve Armory was plunked right down in the middle of these segregated neighborhoods and you have a segregated military as well. And it's a recipe for disaster as people just clash with each other. With a significant military presence now on the streets, the local media's attacks on Mexican-American zoot suitors have a new audience. And although these young naval recruits came to LA prepared to join a fight, no one could have predicted it would be against this supposed enemy within. Los Angeles, World War II, a city of simmering racial tensions and urban paranoia. With zoot suit clad Mexican Americans identified by city officials and the press as a criminal menace, into this hostile environment come thousands of military recruits training for war in the Pacific. And with a naval base constructed in Chavez Ravine amongst segregated neighborhoods, young white servicemen are now coming into regular contact with the zoot suitors, and tensions increase. You have a lot of white servicemen on the streets, in Mexican neighborhoods, at a time when a lot of Mexican youths and Mexican-American youths think of their neighborhoods as their neighborhoods. Some of these military personnel were respectful of the local customs, of the local neighborhoods. Others weren't. And the ones that weren't, particularly the ones that would shout out sexual invitations to the young women that they would see, local men began to react. They're coming from all different parts of the country. They've lost their identity. They're thrown together. They're in a new environment, getting ready to fight a war. And what they find is this culture that has been here for over hundreds of years, and it's a different language. It's a different way of life. It's a slower pace. Enjoy life. Enjoy the weather. Hey, we're at war. You put all of this together in downtown Los Angeles, you just have this smashing together, and it's a culture clash. Although these clashes are initially verbal, by 1943, they become physical, and the naval recruits are regularly returning to Chavez Ravine with injuries from skirmishes. The sailors were taught by their instructors, hey, take a, a sock with you, and you fill it with pennies, and that way you have something to hit somebody if somebody attacks you. Well, you're walking through with some of your friends, and you go, I don't like how that guy's looking at me. Well, he might just go, what are you doing in my neighborhood? And there's a fight. It, it just creates this tension that didn't need to happen. And I think that was driving a lot of people. I'm getting ready to fight hand-to-hand -to -hand in the islands in the Pacific. Let's get a practice run before we go overseas. Throughout May of 1943 in particular, where community gatherings, even a few press reports, 
acknowledge that the city is a tinderbox and that if something is not done to alleviate the tensions between Mexican-American zoot suiters in particular and servicemen on the streets of the city, that something bad will happen, that the city will blow, that there may in fact be full-fledged riotous violence. Rumor and innuendo play a very big role in stoking these racial tensions. You have rumors of Mexican men molesting white women, and likewise you have a lot of rumors that white servicemen are being inappropriate with Mexican women or are beating up Mexican youths on city streets. And so there is quite a tense atmosphere that only builds. May the 8th, 1943. A tipping point is reached. Rumors start circulating that a sailor has been stabbed by a zoot suitor at Lick Pier near Santa Monica. Within hours of the supposed event, nearly 500 servicemen arrive to search for the culprits. As they rampage along the pier, they attack anyone they find in a zoot suit. There were rumors that military were being attacked and, and military personnel in Santa Monica began to hunt down uh, the supposed perpetrators who happened to be Mexican-American. What I find interesting is, is the way that the law enforcement agencies responded. Rather than arresting the rioting military men, they arrested those who were being attacked. The justification was is that they were being put in jail for their own safety and the military were not arrested. At most, they might be rounded up and sent back to their base by the Los Angeles law enforcement, but that was it. The Lick Pier incident proves a precursor to far greater violence. On June the 3rd, 1943, a group of sailors heading back to base passed by two zoot suitors. Mocking the servicemen, one of the youths raises his hand in a Nazi salute. It is the final straw. Rather than get drawn into an immediate conflict, the sailors return to base enlist backup and arm themselves for battle. There were a group of sailors that decided they weren't going to stand for it anymore. They were going to fight back, finally. They leave the Naval Reserve Armory, um, and they come spoiling for a fight. They begin to move downtown in order to clean up the streets of zoot suitors and their negative impact and influence on the city. They're carrying bats and chains and other weapons. They sweep through the neighborhoods that had been giving them problems. They look for the young people that have been harassing them for the past few years, and they identify, they focus in on young people who are wearing the, the fashion of jazz, the zoot suit. As they emerge from the Naval Reserve, they head directly to the spot where they had encountered the zoot suitors, on the corner of Alpine Street and Figueroa. They went to Alpine Street, they didn't encounter anyone there, so they proceeded to hunt down, to fan out throughout the city, and to hunt down Mexican-American zoot suitors, and then Mexicans in general, and then people of color. There are stories of cafes being swept as the military men go through, and identifying someone who simply happens to be wearing a zoot suit, and attacking that individual, or going into theaters, turning on the lights. And, and going through the, the aisles and pulling out young people as, as young as 13 years of age and beating them and stripping them of their clothing and then leaving them naked in the streets uh, simply for, for wearing a zoot suit. As the sailors head to Main Street in downtown Los Angeles, this disrobing of zoot suit wearing teens becomes their primary objective. Violently forcing the youth to undress, the military personnel then begin setting fire to their zoot suits and leave them burning on the street. The zoot suit riots, not unlike the Sleepy Lagoon trial, was a show, an assertion of white authority. They're different. Why can't they be like you and me? They need to be like us, and therefore we're going to force our, our identity onto their identity. It's as if they were saying, you're going to look like us whether you like it or not. You're going to be like us whether you like it or not. This was a spectacle. Just as the zoot suit itself was a spectacle, the attacks on, on zooters and people of color in general were also a part of this spectacle, of this reassertion of, of white power. There are a lot of individuals at the time who believe that Mexican-American youths are shirking their military responsibility, that they are home dressing in controversial attire and going out and jitterbugging. 
Well, the fact of the matter is, a lot of the youths that end up being attacked by service personnel were 13, 14, 15 year old boys who were not of military age and in fact were subject to intense violence by adult men. And although this band of sailors are reined in by the LAPD on June the 3rd, the following night, the violence spreads. Soon, the police and the authorities will turn a blind eye as hundreds of servicemen descend on downtown Los Angeles, transforming the city into a brutal hunting ground. The Zoot Suit Riots have begun. Los Angeles, June 3rd, 1943. After months of minor clashes between local Mexican-American teenagers and sailors training for war, a group of naval recruits head into the downtown district and escalate the conflict. You have these military men who are trained in military tactics. They're trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And as they're sweeping through the neighborhoods of Los Angeles looking for perpetrators, uh, looking for hoodlums, for delinquents, they're happy to find anyone who fits the bill. You have young Mexican-American youths being pulled from movie theaters and brought out into the streets and stripped of their zoot suit clothing and at times having their clothes literally burned in city streets. After hours of hunting down any Latino wearing a zoot suit, these servicemen are eventually apprehended by police and returned to their base. The following night, however, hundreds of sailors armed with makeshift weapons return, prowling along Main Street, while others head straight for the Mexican-American community in Boyle Heights. With such large numbers involved, this time the police choose not to intervene. Police waited until zoot suiters were beaten. They only step in after the mob eases up, after zoot suiters are kicked and punched and hammered and stripped, and their clothes are often burned in flames on the streets of the city. Then they step in. Young Mexican-American men who have been subject to a beating and violence are then taken in by the LAPD and arrested themselves for disturbing the peace. There were rumors that the police actually aided and abetted the rioting servicemen, that they, they helped lead them to suit suitors. As the rioting continues into a third and then a fourth night, the absence of any intervention from either city authorities or the military is conspicuous. With over 150 Latinos injured and 500 arrested, the riots begin to look like an official crackdown on racial minorities. What the Zoot Suit riots were, ultimately, were another example of state-sanctioned violence. By virtue of letting it happen, we see a kind of tacit approval. I think there was a belief, certainly among the sailors, but also the upper command and city authorities, including the mayor's office and the LAPD, that this was necessary. That the violent response against zoot suitors was part and parcel of keeping them in their place. I do think there's absolutely a consensus at this time that what military personnel engaged in was perfectly appropriate behavior. That these were individuals that were problematic in their public appearance, were problematic in particular in the fact that they were challenging segregation and that they needed to be reminded that that was not acceptable in American society. That a society would allow this to happen, that law enforcement who were sworn to protect the public would sit back and allow racialized violence to take place. I lose the language to explain how this could have happened or even to describe the, 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 the atrocity of this kind of violence. As news of these riots spread outside of the city, however, these reports of state-sanctioned violence feed directly into enemy hands. The repercussions were so bad. I mean, it was such an embarrassment across the world that we were fighting in the streets of Los Angeles uh, the enemy, the Germans and the Japanese, just picked up on it and say, this is how bad things are in America. They're fighting each other in the streets of America. It was an embarrassment. June the 8th, 1943, five days after the riots began, senior military officials finally and decisively intervene. Los Angeles is declared out of bounds to all military personnel. 
The only reason the military stepped in was that people in Washington are basically saying, you can't even run your own city. What the hell is going on there? This is being used by the Nazis. This is used by the Japanese. You can't run your own command. Clean it up, clean it up now. What they did is they simply canceled leave and confined men to their bases. And when that happened, the rioting stopped. And that's how the riot ended. The military authorities finally took seriously the fact that something was seriously amiss and did something about it. By the middle of June, race riots erupt in other cities across the US, including New York and Detroit, with both Mexican-American and African-American zoot suiters targeted. Back in Los Angeles, as the dust settles, people begin to ask what exactly had just happened. The local military and civil authorities are condemned nationwide, yet few in the city itself are ready to accept culpability. And when First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt suggests that these events were racially motivated, she is attacked by the Los Angeles press as a communist. You actually do have a governor's committee that is put together directly after the riots, and they come to the conclusion that race was central. The mayor of Los Angeles, however, puts together his own committee which says absolutely race is not a factor. Officials of Los Angeles were loath to call it a race riot. We don't have a racial problem in Los Angeles. It was not a race riot. This was juvenile delinquents who were acting out. And they were also loath to identify military men as the perpetrators of violence as well. And so there were all sorts of, of efforts uh, to tap dance around the fact that this was a very racialized moment. As the city struggles to come to terms with these events, Others are looking to reform its corrupt heart. Established in 1942, the Sleepy Lagoon Defense Committee has been tirelessly working to overturn the convictions of the 38th Street youths. Led by civil rights activists and aided by the star power of prominent supporters such as Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth, in 1944, they successfully bring the case before the Court of Appeal. Here, the original trial is criticized for its bias and the court unanimously reverses all of the convictions. In October, Henry Levas and his friends are freed from San Quentin and reunited with their families. You had a number of Hollywood elites, a number of progressives, members of the Popular Front who had been following the Sleepy Lagoon case throughout the trial and really believed that this was a tremendous miscarriage of justice. These young people were convicted for the murder of Jose Diaz. They would have languished in jail were it not for this small cohort of committed progressive activists. They were not powerful individuals. They were simply citizens who saw an injustice. They showed what a small group of, of committed individuals can do in pushing a nation to live up to the fullness of its promises. As the 38th Street youths and their families rejoice, one man's murder remains unavenged. With no further criminal trial to re-examine the evidence, to this day, the killers of Jose Diaz have escaped justice. The murder of Jose Diaz is, in some ways, eclipsed by the struggle of the young men who were accused of conspiring to murder him, and then their eventual um, success. You know, they were exonerated, they were freed from prison, and Jose Diaz was still dead. In the case of Jose Diaz, the mystery remains unsolved.